On behalf of our students and staff, we welcome you all to this momentous occasion. I want to take this moment to recognize our distinguished, distinguished guests this morning. Uh, Dr. Time, Superintendent, Interim Superintendent of State Hall Public Schools, and many of our guests, including uh, our Banner Creek Middle School Assistant Superintendent Nancy Paez, and many, many other district leaders from the Office of Teaching and Learning, from Communications, and across all the different departments. Thank you for being here with us this morning. We are extremely happy to have the honor of hosting author or as we say in our mother tongue, with her first middle school novel, The Diamond Explorer. Okay. And here to introduce Kalia uh, Ya, it is my pleasure to introduce St. Paul Public Schools Interim Superintendent, Dr. John Time, Dr. Time will serve as interim superintendent during the 24-25 school year until the St. Paul Public Schools Board of Education selects the next superintendent. Uh, Dr. Time is a familiar face here at St. Paul as he has served as interim superintendent in 2016 and 2017. He has also served as the superintendent for the Roseville Area School District for 17 years, retiring in 2017. Dr. Time, if you could please join me, uh, and he's going to help introduce our author this morning. Good morning, everybody. It's a treat to be here at Battle Creek. What a lovely facility. And uh, I wish I'd have been here a little sooner. I could have done something about the air conditioning. Um, thank you, Principal Yang. It's a pleasure to be here. And my name is John Tyne, and I'm the interim superintendent at St. Paul Public Schools. And I'm here today with humility and have feeling great honor in introducing a wonderful former St. Paul Public School student and the parent of St. Paul Public School kids. Okay. Uh, our guest work has been recognized by the National Endowment of the Arts, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Chautiquois Park Prize, the Penn USA Literary Awards, the Dayton Literary Awards, and it goes on and on and on. It's such a privilege to get to meet our new guest, our guest. Today, the Hmong American teacher, speaker, and writer is releasing her newest book, Diamond Explorer. And I happen to have a copy of it right here, and I'm going to take it home and share it with my grandchildren. So I'm very excited about that. It is with a sense of great honor that I'm privileged to introduce our author, Kao Kalia. Thank you, Superintendent Time. Can you all hear me in the back? Yeah. Perfect, and thank you, Principal Yang, and your entire team for welcoming me today. And I want to thank all of you for looking so good. I, um, I should say this. I was six and a half years old, and my family came here as refugees of war. The very first school that I ever went to was Battle Creek Elementary School, where a teacher in a reindeer sweater looked at me and said, say your ABCs. And I remember looking up at her and saying, A, B, and C. She shook her head and said, say all of them. And again, I repeated A, B, and C, because that was all I knew. I'm here because I stuck, and the St. Paul Public School stuck with me all the way through. I graduated from Harding High School in 1999. And like so many of you in this room, I graduated thinking that I would become a doctor or a lawyer. Because our parents, generations of immigrants and refugees before us and those who will come along, they believe that doctors can heal what is broken in the human body, that lawyers protect the rights that we've never had enough of. So when I graduated from St. Paul Public School, I thought, one day I'm going to become a doctor. But that's not why I'm here today. 
Today, I am here because I am a writer, because I use my words like medicine. I want to heal what is broken in the human heart. I'm here today because I think it's so important for all of you to see someone who looks like you, someone who speaks English with the same uncertainties, the same push, the same pull. I'm here because I wrote this book for, for you. I became an author first as an adult author of memoir. But from the moment I entered my first school, the question was, when are you going to write for us? When are you going to write for us? And so finally, my debut middle grade fiction is here. And it is for you. And all of the middle schoolers all over the years have asked me to do one thing. They've said, can you make the book scary? And the thing about being an author is, I can only scare you if I scare myself first. So this little book, The Diamond Explorer, consists of many sleepless nights. Actually, of all of my titles, including the adult titles, this one has taken the longest to write. I began working on this one in 2017. And I began working on it on the premise of a real life moment. I have a brother named Maxwell. And Maxwell was a kid when we moved away from the St. Paul Public Schools. Maxwell grew up in a school district a little bit up north. And in school, nobody wanted to be Maxwell's friend because every time Maxwell would talk about the garage, he was in gala. Because that's the way my parents said garage, galage. So nobody wanted to be Maxwell's friend. And I have a very keen memory. Maxwell is, Maxwell is five and I'm, I'm Nobody is his friend, I know this. So I go to the school bus to wait for Maxwell. This bus comes and he gets out and I go up to him and I said, how was your day? And Maxwell looked at me and Maxwell said, not too bad. He said, today when I came on the bus, there was one open seat beside a boy with blonde hair and blue eyes. And I sat beside him. And then the bus started moving and he told me to get up. But there's a rule, you cannot get up in a moving bus, we all know this. So instead of getting up, Maxwell crouched all the way home. And Maxwell, the next day I go to get him again and I'm a little heartbroken for this kid. And I said, how was your day? And he says, it's better. And I said, why? He said, I found an empty seat and I sat by myself. But you know what? And I said, what? And he said, I put my book back on the ground. I left the space open in case someday some kid wants to sit beside me. That broke my heart. Maxwell, who is so keen on finding the beauty of a bigger world, who struggles to find it within himself. And so the Diamond Explorer was born. I wanted to write a book for this kid, this little kid that I love dearly, understanding one thing, that all of the adults who love you we are limited by the range of our experiences. You will adventure, you will go into the places none of us can imagine. And that is the measure of our love. Not our ability to understand, but our willingness to travel wherever you need us to go. And so the Diamond Explorer is here. It is scary because it deals with our world. It deals with the fact that so many of us speak English with accents, if not with, via our voices, then in our heads and in our hearts that these are the foundations on which we stand. This is a scary book because it deals with racism. For those of us who are not born white, we understand that when the world looks at us, there are expectations, that there are limitations. As a writer, I can tell you, doesn't matter where I am, in a stage full of 10,000, 30,000 people, the number one comment I get when I'm done is always, you are not what I expected. And the question is always, why? What were you expecting when you invited a short little woman? You gave her a microphone to amplify the strength of a weak voice. And you say, talk to us. Were they expecting me to speak to the stereotypes that they held inside, the assumptions and the presumptions? Because that would be a mistake. That is not who I am. That is not who we are. We're not here to play to other people's expectations. We're here to rise above them. A really good St. Paul Public School teacher told me once that the purpose of an education is to push beyond the limits of what we know. And every teacher in this room, every educator, I think, agrees with me. 
that knowledge changes. The only thing that does not is one human heart saying to the other, I care. I care about the future you're building. I care about the beautiful future that you're walking toward without me. A long time ago, I was taught in the St. Paul Public Schools that matter could not be created or destroyed. Then my younger siblings grew up and they were taught that with massive amounts of energy, we can create small bits of matter. Knowledge changes. The earth was once, to believed, once believed to be a flat place, but now we know otherwise. I'm here because this writer's heart cares about your journey. I care about the stories that live inside of you. I'm here because I understand that those stories will create the histories in the books that future generations will study from. That the people who create history are like you and me. That sometimes our voices are soft, that sometimes we are scared, but we speak anyway. So that is why I'm here. But I can't be here without reading from the book, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna read a little bit from the Diamond Explorer. So this is the Diamond Explorer, and it says, everybody thinks they know where you belong, but how can they if you yourself, if you do not know? So I'll, I will read to you from the very beginning. And this book is an interesting book because in the very beginning of this book, we don't hear from this kid at all. His name is Malcolm. He was born on the Minnesota prairie, but everybody wants to know where he's from. Malcolm speaks again with an accent. And in the beginning of this book, like so many other interactions with young people, we hear from his teachers, we hear from his parents, we hear from his siblings, we hear from all of the people in his life. This is how we meet so many, so many young people. And so in the beginning, you don't hear from Malcolm. And this is the opening, chapter one, kindergarten, Miss Johnson. The Hmong boy was alone again, standing by the wall, his hands behind his back, looking at his flip-flops. All year long, he has been like this. Why can't he make some effort to engage with the rest of the class? Today, his face was tilted down, so all I could see was his head of spiky black hair. What kind of person, what kind of parents send their child to school in flip-flops? It was better that he wasn't playing with the other kids on the playground or the fields after all. The last thing I needed was another student stepping on his toes. Last night, the Hmong boy came to conferences with his mom and his sister. It was so embarrassing. I extended my hand first to the sister and said, hi, you must be Malcolm's mother. The sister corrected me. I'm Malcolm's big sister. Hello, Miss Johnson. She didn't shake my hand. She gestured to the older woman behind her in the brown sweater and said, this is our mother. The woman didn't extend her hand either. Of course, I had to make the first move again. There was so little to report on Malcolm. I took them to the table and had Malcolm pull out a chair from a nearby desk for himself. I took a deep breath. Let's start, shall we? They all nodded. The children's seats were perfect for them. The mother and sister were hardly bigger than Malcolm. Most of the fifth graders in the school are taller than them. Bless my heart, I did not say, you have a very slow kid. Instead, I said, Malcolm is very quiet. He doesn't bother anyone. He doesn't say very much to me at all. To show the mother and sister that Malcolm and I had a relationship, I tried to make a joke with him. I said, Malcolm, you are a stoic little man, aren't you? The boy looked up at me, but didn't blink. There was no hint of laughter in his eyes, just serious regard. I had to say, a serious little man you have there, and look toward the sister and the mother for confirmation. Like him, they just looked at me. I could feel my cheeks tightening as I opened my mouth to show them a smile. Okay, does, does anyone have any questions before I go over his report card? The sister cleared her throat. She said, Malcolm says that the other students in the classroom don't talk to him. It, if he isn't bothering anyone, what is the problem? I was taken aback by her directness, but not surprised. Those, these people are always looking for problems where none exist. I told her and her mother, who was pulling the brown sweater tight across her front, the truth. The other kids are still getting used to him. The sister pushed me, saying in her small, thin voice, but it has been a full school year. I told them what they should already know. Malcolm is a shy kid. What else can I say? 
The sister turned to the mother and spoke in their language. I took the opportunity to get a good look at the mother. The older woman looked tired. Strands of hair fell on her face. Half of her, half of her hair was twisted, combed back, twisted into a knot gray, small strands of white coming loose. She twisted her small red hands together nervously under my gaze, though she kept her eyes only on her daughter. I noticed how she folded into a chair, a doll bent at the waist. As her daughter spoke, the older woman's hands moved to her lap and she wiped them nervously on her blue jeans. Looking at her hands gave me a feeling of pain in my own. When I finally spoke again, my voice was loud enough, even to my own ears. It might be a good idea to find a different school for Malcolm next year, one where he wasn't, where he won't feel so alone. That is from the beginning of the book. How many of you have been to parent-teacher conferences with your parents, where before the gazes of your teachers you could see the discomfort in your mom and your dad, the lack of understanding? Quite a few of us in this room, right? So I'm going to take you then to the other part of the book, way in the back. This is the moment Malcolm steps into his own destiny. We, each and every single one of us, are born into stories with the expectations that we live in the great stories, that we create them. And this is the, the moment Malcolm embarks on a journey on his own, by himself. Fong is Malcolm's older brother. That night, I felt Fong snoring in bed and snuck out of the room. I walked through the dark house, careful to be quiet when I walked down the hall, down the flight of stairs into the front room where we had performed the shaman's rituals for Linda, down the second flight of stairs into the lower level to the unfinished side of the basement. I entered the first room and reached for the string to the single bulb. The darkness retreated. I didn't want my imagination to get the best of me, so I walked quickly to the second room, then the third. I pulled the light bulb string. I faced the wall. I could smell it. The scent was not unpleasant. It smelled dry and chalky. Even though the wall had been in the basement when mom and dad had bought the house before I was born, it smelled surprisingly new. I took a deep breath. I reached for the wall. The wall was firm but had a little give to it, like cardboard. It felt warm. I went closer. I pressed my ear to it. I listened. I could hear the house through that gray wall, the buzz of electricity. It felt alive against my ear, not cold and dead like the concrete wall behind me. I found myself leaning farther and farther into the cancer wall, a little afraid and a little comforted at once. I imagined the wall giving in, absorbing me. I pressed my I, myself firmly against its surface. The water heater made a sound. I felt the wall breathe. I jerked away. Without looking back, I ran as fast as I could away from the wall, my heart pounding, feeling the wall's invisible, cancerous hands reach for me. When I reached our bedroom, much less quietly than I left it, Fong was still snoring, his belly rising and falling beneath the furry blanket. He told me, he, the furry blanket, he told me, had been boss. I was quiet as I crawled to my side of the bed. I felt cold everywhere. My feet were frozen. I inched my cold feet closer to Fong's warm ones, careful not to touch him. I could hear a train speeding by on the tracks across the street opposite the neighbor's lot. I felt our house shake a little in its wake. I pulled the covers close. That night, I had a horrible nightmare that the cancer wall was alive. It had been alive the whole time we lived in the house. It waited patiently for me in the third room on the lower level for many years. In the nightmare, the wall was a small man, a dead man with hair falling over his face, thin arms at his sides, at the sides of his full, square-shaped body. He looked strangely familiar, smiling from beyond the gray, a big open mouth, and then a voice I knew very well from my life. Goo's voice softly calling my name, calling me to go close to him. Malcolm Law, Malcolm Law. And that is the beginning of his journey. Malcolm is destined to become a great shaman, but he has no idea. He wants to save all of the lives around him. He knows he cannot. What happens when you meet yourself? What happens when you look into your own eyes and you see the thing that you fear the most? The foundations of your faith itself. So that is a little bit from the, Malcolm, the, the Diamond Explorer. 
I'm going to save the scariest part for tonight when I'm doing the community event at 530. Um, but I am here for you, and at this time, I want to give you opportunities to talk to me. You can see I don't have a speech. I'm not interested in speaking at you. I'm here. I'm here to be in conversation with you. So please, at this point, if you have questions, there's, uh, there are your teachers with microphones, and we will begin right there. And then Principal Yang will tell me when we have five more minutes so I know when to wrap up. Perfect. We have, some, we have some questions that we're already pre-entry in. Oh, do you need the microphone? So, Please. Yeah, just, you know what, when you're giving speeches, you kind of misplace the mic, so I apologize. We do have some questions that are, were already submitted in for Kalia, and then we're also going to give the opportunity for students to also ask any of questions about, for, uh, of our author as well, okay? So hang tight, let me find the mics. Got one right here. Jerry, where's the other one? All right, so we have the first question. The first question was already submitted for us. As a founder of St. Paul Public Schools, can you share any memories of educators who helped you see your own potential? So as a student of St. Public Schools, can I share any memories that really helped me realize my potential? I have to talk about Mrs. Gallatin. At Harding High School, there was an Irish woman, Mrs. Gallatin. She had a red face. And the thing about Mrs. Gallatin is either she was laughing or yelling. So I was really scared of Mrs. Gallatin. And my older sister, who had had Mrs. Gallatin, told me, Mrs. Gallatin doesn't like a lot of eyeliners, I think. So I wore no eyeliners. I sat in the front of the class every day. And on the test that Mrs. Gallatin gave us, uh, I would do a good job. I should tell you that I grew up in the St. Paul Public Schools as a selective mute. I didn't talk. I lost my voice along the way because I was realizing that the world around me did not need to hear my mom and my dad so often. And so I didn't talk. And I knew that I was doing well on Mrs. Gallatin's test. But one day, Mrs. Gallatin saw me. And we lived in a moldy house on the east side of St. Paul. And I'm still on the east side of St. Paul. I came back to the neighborhood that raised me. Although when I was younger, I used to think, one day when I get enough money, I'm going to move far away from here. I'm going to take everybody I love far away from this place where there are empty bottles rolling down on the sidewalks. We're going to move so far away. But then you grow up and you know what you realize? I'm not so bad. This neighborhood raised me and so many others are pretty incredible. So I came back to raise my kids here. But on the east side of St. Paul, there was this teacher, Mrs. Gallatin. We lived in a moldy house. The mold grew wild every winter because the heat was insufficient to heat it up. And no matter how many layers of paint or how hard we scrubbed with bleach, the, wall, the mold would just grow. So I was always sick. And in class, I do what so many of us do. When you need a Kleenex and there are no Kleenexes, you suck it in. So I was like this <laughs> the whole time. And Mrs. Gallatin took a look at me. And the first time, Mrs. Gallatin said, do you need to go to the bathroom? And as I'm walking to the bathroom, I'm realizing it's not how I'm doing on the test. Mrs. Gallatin sees me. She sees me trying to suck in my snot, and she's offering me a pass to the bathroom. The next day, I notice that there's a box of Kleenex right there beside me, that Mrs. Gallatin had placed a box of Kleenex right there beside me. And I'm thinking, wait, this teacher cares about me. And then we read Romeo and Juliet. And Mrs. Gallatin gave us one, one, one essay, and it is, is a story of Romeo and Juliet, a story of love or lust. I was a ninth grader. I knew very little of romantic love and, or lust, and so I, I wrote about my parents. I wrote about how my mom and my dad, how sometimes she wishes that she hadn't married him, that if my mom hadn't married my dad, she could have had an easier life. And how my dad, he thinks that the luckiest thing in his life is that he got to be with my mom. I wrote about how these two people, they go to bed in the same place every night and they wake up in the same place and they fight the same fight in the factories and somehow they keep holding on across the seasons. And I wrote that we'll never know if Romeo and Juliet really loved each other because they never had the chance. I submitted the essay and then immediately I got really scared because I'm like, what are you doing, Galia? But later on, Mrs. Gallatin catches me in the hallway 
and she stops me and she says to me, do you know that you're gonna do so well in college? First time anybody's ever said that to me. She said, because all college is, is reading and writing. You know how to put the things in your life onto the page. You're gonna do so well in college. Mrs. Gallatin remains a dear mentor of mine, long retired now, still red in the face. I hear her laughing more often than yelling these days. But Mrs. Gallatin made possible for me the idea that a Hmong girl, first generation Hmong girl in America, where all the statistics were saying I wasn't gonna be able to do well in college, that I could do well. She defied the statistics that govern my life. And in so doing, gave me an opportunity to follow suit, to rise, to rise. That's what the good teachers do. They let you climb a little bit higher than you think you can go. Did I answer the question? Yes. Thank yeah? You so much. Please. I have a Please. One more time, please. Ooh. I would love to share about my writing process. This is one of my favorite questions. So I have three kids. I have identical twin boys who are nine and a daughter who is 11. And when we moved into our house on the east side of St. Paul, we all learned that the lock to my office didn't work. And then when they knew that it really wasn't working, they'd just come in any time. And I, I didn't have the heart to change the lock on my office. So first and foremost, I don't, um, the office door to my, to my writing place is never locked, which means the family flows in and out, which means that I don't have a lot of un uninterrupted time. Before I had kids, I liked to write in coffee shops where there are big windows and green things growing. The moment I had kids, I realized I have to write whenever I was not sleepy, and I had to make a count. As a writer, I just say to you that I, move, I make most of my living through public speaking. So I travel all across the country, and usually people pay me a lot of money to talk. And I know, for a selective mute, this is impossible to conceive of. Um, but I travel a lot, and every time I go away, I think I have to make this count because I'm leaving my kids. I'm leaving my elderly mom and dad. I'm leaving St. Paul, Minnesota behind. I have to make a count. You know, I'm not what people think about when they think about a Minnesota author. We are the state with Garrison Keillor. We are the state with Louise Erdrich. But when people hear that I'm from Minnesota, they always look at me, and they always look at me again. And so I know that the work I do on the page matters. I know that everything I write becomes part of the body of literature for a people. There are not a lot of writers all over the world who can say this, but no matter how good or bad the writing is, it becomes a foundation for our people's entrance into American literature. I understand the responsibility before me. So when I write, I write passionately. I let the words that sit in my fingertips dance on the page, and I tell myself, you are a writer right now. You are not an editor. Somebody will come and they will tell you what is good and what is bad on this page, but right now your job is to write as much of it as you can, as honestly as you can. And so I always write with a racing heart. My father says to me, Galia, when are you gonna learn how to still the leaves of your fluttering heart? I'm 43 and it hasn't happened yet. So I don't know that it will ever happen, but I write feverishly and I write knowing that the thing on the page is the most truest photo of me, truest photo of my heart, my mind, my ideas, my thoughts, and that's enough. And I think that's a really necessary thing if you're gonna write, because how many of us in this room fall apart because we're so afraid of the mistakes that we'll write? I'm here to tell you that you will write there are many chicken, and the teacher will understand just as there are chickens. That S, like the foundations of a language, meaning is beyond these things. And that sometimes the accents that we live with, they flavor our words on the page and that is okay too. I wanna give you the courage to write because I have to give myself the courage to write every time I'm up against a blank screen. I have to tell myself, maybe what you write doesn't matter to all of the world but maybe what you write matters to someone in this world. Maybe they're waiting just for this word, maybe they're waiting for just this sentence, and that maybe by writing it, you will open up another heart, keep the world wide open for each other. And so I go on the page and I write feverishly, 
On average, I write about 29 pages every two hours, but that is two hours that I stay at my, at my computer writing. And that is the hardest thing to learn as a young writer, how to sit your butt down and keep on going at it, even when you feel there are many walls between you and the end. Um, so that's what I do. I bust through walls on the page every time, every single time. And I've been doing this professionally now for over 20 years. And it's, it's always the same. So that's how I write, furiously. Every opportunity I get, and I give it the best shot that I can, knowing that there will always be somebody else in the world telling me where the mistakes are. One more question. Please. What comes to you first when writing, plot or character? I love this question. For Malcolm, for this particular book, Malcolm came to me first. And at first, I had a hard time pulling Malcolm away from Maxwell. But then I realized Malcolm had his own beating heart. He had his own way of navigating the world. And so Malcolm came to me first. I entered into the pages of, pages of this book knowing only that it was going to be scary because it was going to deal with our world and the worlds beyond, that we were going to tangle. I had no idea that in the pages of a middle grade fiction book, I would try to meet again the people who had died so I could be here. That those stories that I had been born with, that they would, they would create a vessel for me to sail, not to the seas we know, but toward the skies we can't imagine. But that's the thing about writing. You begin wherever you need to begin. You just have to understand that you have to burst open the seams of your world. Because we, as writers, we are our first readers. Trust me, if the thing that you've written is really boring to you, chances are it's going to be boring to your readers. And so for me, it's always important to keep myself interested, to keep myself engaged. That is how you keep coming back to a, to a work. In America, it takes an average of five years to write a book. This one took far longer than five years. And I'm a very fast writer. There have been books out there that I've written in one hour, right? So, so you can imagine seven years coming back and forth. But I had to, Malcolm demanded that time. Here was a character who was saying, you're going to meet everybody else, and then you're going to meet me. What if you have to work to earn the trust of a character? That's a bold thing to do in children's lit. But I think it's so important, because all of us have to work in order to, to secure your trust, for you to understand that we are on your team, that we're cheering, on, cheering you on to futures we won't be able to visit. And so Malcolm led me in this book. And Malcolm is slow, and Malcolm is patient, and that is not who Ngogaliaya is. That is not who I am. But the thing about my work is that it's made me bigger than, my, than, than, than I can be. It's like a microphone. Away from the microphone. Away from the microphone. You can't hear my voice. My work has amplified my heart for a bigger world. That's how I know I'm doing good work. That's how we know we are doing good work. All of your teachers in here, all of the adults in your life, if the work that they're doing is making them better for the world, then they're doing the thing they were born to do. And I want to say this to you all as a closing note. Today, I am a character in the book of your life. Whether you realize it or not, today, I'm a character in the book of your life. And you know what I got to ask myself this morning? When I was choosing my dress, I said, what kind of character do I want to be in the lives of all of these students? What kind of character do I want to be? And I think it's such a healthy way to think about the world. We are not just passing each other by. 10 years, 20 years from now, when you hear the name Go Ya, when you come across one of these books, you will remember me as I am today, 43 years old, my whole heart living in my throat for you all. Because I want you to know that in the story of my life, if there is one moment, I want this moment to be in it. St. Paul Public Schools, I'm here because of you. It wasn't a perfect journey, but you gave me what I needed to stand strong, to stand in the world and say we matter and we matter to each other, that every single person has something to say about the history that we are creating together, about the future that we're building. So I thank you for having me back I thank all of you for being so beautiful, for giving me reasons to look forward to different seasons where things will bloom again because you all walk the world, you laugh and you cry in it. Thank you.
we, we, we really want to just say thank you to Galia for choosing Fabric Creek Middle School to debut the Diamond Explorer. So can we give it up for our Galia young please? The students at Fabric Creek Middle School are really special, just like Melvin. Galia, we. Galia, we really appreciate being the location of this debut. Your book is so important because it tells the story of our community, a story that is often not heard. The story is an accurate portrayal of the immigrant experience that is reflected not only here at Battle Creek, but across the public schools. So at this time, I'm gonna have my teacher, Ms. Kia Yang, Mana, and my web students please come up and join me. These are Battle Creek's leaders, and they have been helping us to prepare for this event. And so I want to just give the recognition to our web leaders. Make sure everyone can see you. This is, uh, this is going to be on TV, I, I always see. This is a photo on. So, tell me, after show our gratitude, we would like to present you with a small token on behalf uh, as for just to show how much we're grateful that you're here today. So, Web students, if you may, who has it? Okay. So we have a shirt, a better big shirt for you. Thank you. All right, where's this one, Steve? All right. Oh, All right. And then we have a couple other gifts for you as well. We have a couple other gifts for you as well. You turn the cover of your book into buttons. And so we have some for students, and they'll be available tonight. And I set some aside for you in this bag. Thank you. So, Thank you so much. So can we please? Give it up for Galia Yan in this historical, momentous occasion to celebrate with us here at Banner Creek and for being the best students on the east side of St. Paul, Banner Creek Panthers. Thank you for being here with us. Okay? All right. And I know you're all like just so excited to go to period two, right? And the time is 9:53. And so at this time, I'm going to ask my wonderful educators if you can lead our students out so they can get ready to transition to the next class. Thank you.